Hi everyone, John Sackles zooming in from Tucson, Arizona in the United States. And today I'm going to be talking about awake tracheal intubation in the emergency department. I work at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. And I'd like to present top 10 tricks for successful awake tracheal intubation in the emergency department. Here's my little algorithm on where ATI fits in in my emergency airway management in the emergency department. Um, I first decide if the patient needs intubation. If they need intubation in the ED, then I assess difficulty, both anatomic and physiologic. If they're not presumed to be too difficult, then I do RSI, which is obviously the vast majority of patients. If they have anatomic or physiologic concerns that I cannot overcome, then I do awake tracheal intubation. Tip number one is that awake tracheal intubation is a technique, not a device. Historically, we have normally done awake tracheal intubation with a flexible fiber optic scope. It's very well tolerated by the patient. It's easy to control and navigate around abnormal anatomy. However, if you don't, do not have a flexible scope available or not skilled in its use, you can still do an awake tracheal intubation in the emergency department. You just have to use a di different device. And you could use a rigid video laryngoscope. Here's a picture of the glide scope. Or if you don't even have that, you can do it with a direct laryngoscope. The important fact is the patient is not put to sleep and not paralyzed, but maintain an awake state so they can protect the airway and maintain spontaneous ventilation. Number two, you want to get all the help you can. These patients are difficult airways, and obviously you want a good team to help you manage them. That might be colleagues in other specialties, that might be nurses, paramedics, techs, anyone you feel that you can trust to help you through this critical procedure. Number three, failure should be planned for, not something that is wandered into. Awake tracheal intubation has a very high success rate. However, in these difficult airway situations, there is risk of loss of the airway. Therefore, you have to be ready with some backup plans. So I always have an induction agent and a paralytic agent ready, typically ketamine and rocuronium. And if things get into a bad situation, I might go ahead and administer those to optimize my chances of success. You also wanna have rescue devices available. You wanna have a video laryngoscope available. You wanna have a superglottic airway. And yes, you wanna have a surgical airway kit available because in rare circumstances, you might have complete airway obstruction with a can intubate, can oxygenate scenario, and you might have to rescue that with a scalpel. So all this stuff needs to be ready and uh, at your disposal if you need them. Number four, topicalize like your life depends upon it. This is really the only drug you need for awake tracheal intubation is lidocaine. There's two preparations here that I like to use. One is a lidocaine ointment, 5%. It's a very thick ointment. If you put it on a tongue blade and apply it to the middle of the tongue and have the patient close their mouth, the ointment melts, it liquefies and goes down the posterior oropharynx and coats the upper airway. And then you could supplement that with some lidocaine spray. Uh, here you see 4% solution. The higher the concentration, the better. In terms of atomization, you want to use something like the mucosal at, uh, atomizer device seen on the left, where you put your anesthetic in the syringe and it's got a little atomizer on the tip of that catheter there and there's a wire inside that catheter. So it's a malleable aluminum wire that you could conform to the patient's airway to spray around the back of the tongue and try to anesthetize the larynx. On the right, you see a commercial atomization device called the Easy Spray that connects to oxygen. And when you depress the lever, you get a spray of lidocaine coming out. And again, basically, you just spray, spray paint the mucosa uh, to achieve good topical anesthesia. And also remember, your fiber intubation fiber optic scope has a working channel on it. So I like to put some lidocaine solution on the working channel, and then as I approach the airway, give a little bit extra topical anesthesia to the upper airway, particularly the laryngeal inlet, um, which is very sensitive. Number five, consider an anti silagogue before topicalization. Glycopyrrolate is what I like to use in the emergency department. I give 0 0.2 milligrams IV before the procedure. Now this takes about 15 or 20 minutes to really desiccate the mucosa, but it's very helpful in improving the topical anesthesia because instead of secretions on the tongue, the topical anesthetic now uh, contacts the mucosa directly. In addition to that, by minimizing the secretions, which is the enemy of the fiber optic scope, you minimize contamination of the scope. Number six is you want to vasoconstrict the nose. If you're doing a transnasal route, the nasal mucosa is uh, 
very thick and boggy. And if you just put the scope in there without uh, a topical vasoconstrictor, it um, may cause bleeding. So by spraying some oxymetalazone in there, that shrinks the mucosa, gives you a bigger passage to pass your scope, and also provides vasoconstriction to minimize bleeding from the intubation. Number seven, approach sedation with trepidation. The reason I say this is the majority of patients that are intubated in the emergency department are intubated for pathology that involves obstructive airway disease. I'm talking about patients with anaphylaxis, patients with uh, angioedema, hematomas of their upper airway, and these patients have a very compromised airway, and the only thing keeping them open is the muscle tone. And if you provide even a little bit of sedation, you have a risk of converting that to a completely obstructed airway. Here you see a patient that I intubated in the emergency department with a fiber optic scope that had uh, hemophilia, and he coughed violently and afterwards came in with a huge hematoma on his epiglottis and on his area epiglottic folds all the way down to his arytenoids. And you can see he's got a very compromised airway. The only thing that's keeping that airway patent is his muscle tone pulling everything out away from that uh, airway. A little bit of sedation can cause complete collapse of that and uh, complete loss of the airway. If sedation is absolutely necessary, then I have two options available. There's ketamine and dexmedetomidine, and which of these I choose depends on how much time I have. If it's a very time compressed situation, then I'll use something like ketamine, 10 milligram uh, aliquots, and I push just small amount of ketamine, just enough so they can tolerate the uh, procedure. Nowhere near induction doses. I'm talking probably 30 to 40 milligrams total for uh, the ketamine. If you have more time, then you could use dexmedetomidine that requires starting an infusion. And after around 20 or 25 minutes, the patient should be in a good state to be instrumented. Remember, this supplements your topical anesthesia and is not a substitute for it. Number eight, maintain oxidation like a, a boss. These patients with difficult airways are at critical risk of loss of the airway. So I like to give them high amounts of oxygen during the procedure to give me a little bit of buffer. On the left, you see high flow nasal oxygen, the OptiFlow system, and on the right, you see high flow on the Vapotherm system. I put all my patients on this before I do a awake intubation. I pre-oxygenate them with it, and then I maintain it throughout the procedure to maintain oxygenation at safe levels. Some patients, particularly those with large physiologic shunts, um, are hypoxic and cannot tolerate um, awake intubation without desaturating. So sometimes I'll actually use non-invasive ventilation during the procedure to um, maintain oxygenation. Here's a BiPAP mask, this is a nasal mask. So I'll put them on BiPAP with a nasal mask, give them sedents, oxygenate them, and then intubate them transorally. And if SATs start going down to the procedure, all you have to do is withdraw the scope, close the, the mouth, and your SATs should come up to where they were at baseline when you started. Number nine is you want to anti-fog the scope. The optics of the scope is obviously on the tip, and if you introduce a cold scope into the patient, the uh, moisture in the patient's oropharynx will condense on the scope and uh, cause visibility problems for you. So it's very helpful to use an anti-fog solution on the tip of the scope as is uh, depicted on the left. Uh, the other option is to warm up the scope, and this is uh, can be done with either uh, warm water, if you fill a, a basin with warm water and put the scope in there, or if you have warm towels or warm blankets, you can go ahead and open them up and put the scope in between. The idea is you wanna warm the scope to the patient's temperature so when it's introduced, there's no condensation that forms. Number 10, don't believe everything you hear. I'm not done, there's more than 10 tips. Number 11, avoid slack in the scope. As you know, the uh, intubation uh, scope is flexible and it has a loop in it. And if you insert this in the patient and have a loop between the, the handle and the tip, any movements of the handle would not be transmitted to the tip. So it's very important to straighten out the scope and keep it taut. So when you turn the handle, that's transmitted to the tip. Number 12, preload the tracheal tube into the patient. There's two ways of doing intubation. Some people like to take the endotracheal tube and put it on the proximal portion of the scope. And then once they get the fiber optic scope in the airway, then railroad it all the way down off the scope in the airway. My preference is actually to go ahead and put the tube into the patient, whether it be the nose or the mouth. Here you can see uh, the tube inserted into the, the nose and it's going to the nasopharynx and we push it through until it emerges from the nasopharynx and is, is just hanging out above the glottis. 
This allows your conduit for your scope to be delivered to the airway. You simply put the scope in the tube, and when you emerge from the tip of the, the endotracheal tube, you're just a couple centimeters from the uh, larynx, and just a matter of navigating that last couple of centimeters and getting it through the vocal cords uh, to complete your intubation. The other advantage of preloading the tube in the patient is it prevents contamination of scope. So this whole way that the scope's going in, there's no risk of contamination from secretions or blood or whatnot. Number 13, be aware of tube hang up. Now this is a little video of a tube exchange um, that occurred in our emergency department. As you can see, that green catheter is the tube exchanger. And as you can see, it sits in that groove in between the arytenoids, the interarytenoid notch. Now, although it's a tube exchange, the fiber optic occupies the same position, again, because it's a small caliber device. And when your tube comes railroaded down the fiber optic scope, as soon as it hits the uh, larynx, that bevel tends to engage the arytenoid. And there you can see the right arytenoid being engaged. And if you keep pushing it, just keeps pushing the larynx away from, it, away from you, there's no way you're going to get that to go in. What you want to do is withdraw the uh, tube and rotate it to rotate the bevel off of the retinoid. And it often works just to keep twirling the scope as you go in. Obviously, a twirl to the left uh, is going to work better because that's going to pull the bevel off the retinoid. Number 14, you don't have an airway until the tube is in, the scope is out, and you have end tidal CO2 return. The reason I say this is that some people I've seen attempt an awake tracheal intubation with a fiber optic scope, have a view of the airway, but it's moving around, the patient's coughing, and the larynx is moving, and the cords are opening and closing, and they say, well, maybe we should just put them to sleep and paralyze them. This way I can just drive it right in. Well, that's not going to happen because once you put them to sleep, the airway will no longer be where you think it is. Everything will collapse, and you have lost the airway. So no drugs during the intubation until your tube is in and you have entitled CO2 return. Number 15, consider awake tracheal intubation for the physiologically difficult airway. My colleagues here at the University of Arizona uh, and I wrote a paper on the physiologically difficult airway in about 2015, where we pointed out that this is analogous to the anatomically difficult airway, but in this situation, there's physiologic issues that make intubation uh, difficult and very high risk. And this is a paragraph from that paper where we say the physiologically difficult airway is one in which physiologic derangements place the patient at higher risk of cardiovascular collapse with intubation. So it's well accepted to do a weight tracheal intubation for the patient with an anatomically difficult airway. I don't think you'll find anyone that would argue against using it in this patient. But I'm saying in patients that are physiologically compromised, a weight tracheal intubation also makes a lot of sense. Here's a patient that came in with ARDS and had SATs of 75%. And you say, well, just oxygenate them better. And then when you oxygenate them better, you can go ahead and RSI them. The problem is that's the SATs on maximum oxygenation. This patient was on vasopressors, inhaled nitric oxide, as well as BiPAP at settings of 23 over 15. And this is the best SATs I can get before intubation, 75%. So as you can see, if you RSI a patient like this, this patient's on the steep part of the curve. As soon as you put the patient to sleep, those SATs are going to plummet, and you're racing the clock to cardiac arrest. The same patient also had acute right heart failure from the hypoxemia from his ARDS. And as you can see here on this ultrasound, the RV is huge. It's compressing the left ventricle. The left ventricle is being starved of blood. The cardiac out output is reduced, and this patient is hypotensive. Again, if you RSI a patient like this, the pushing of the induction agent might be enough to put this patient over the cliff and into cardiac arrest. Whereas if you do an awake intubation, you can preserve hemodynamics um, in a safer fashion. So what I'm saying is there's patients, come in, patients that come in the emergency department that are critically ill and need to be resuscitated. And if they're adequately resuscitated before intubation, then you can RSI them. However, there are a few patients that come in that have refractory hypoxemia or refractory shock. And RSI is dangerous in those patients and awake tracheal intubation should be considered an option to intubate these patients to preserve spontaneous ventilation and minimize oxygen desaturation and to minimize the impacts of uh, hemodynamics on the, with the induction agents. All right, so I think I'll wrap things up. I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you all, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to get together. Here's some contact information for me if anyone uh, would like to get in touch with me. And yes, a lot of people ask, I am Airway Man. Thank you.